I want to read you a story. Uh, you'll enjoy this story. It's, it's a good story. And uh, it's really helped me recently as I've been thinking and preparing on the love of God. It says this. When I was in high school, I met a guy called Randy. Randy would, had three things I really didn't have. A Triumph motorcycle, a beard and a girlfriend. It just didn't seem fair. I wanted all three things in ascending order. I asked around and found out Randy didn't even go to the high school. He just hung out there. Oh, I'd heard about guys like that, so I figured I'd keep my distance from him, and I did. Later, I heard Randy was a Christian and worked with an outfit called Young Life. I didn't know much about any of that stuff, but it helped to explain the beard and made it okay that he was hanging out in the high school, I guess. Randy never offered me a ride on his motorcycle, but he did try to engage me in discussions about Jesus. I kept him at arm's length, but that didn't seem to chill his interest in finding out who I was and what I was about. I figured maybe he didn't know anyone his own age, so we eventually became friends. I was a lousy student and found that, that I could take a test to get a certificate which was the equivalent of a high school diploma. I couldn't figure out how to sign up for that test though, which was a reflection, which on reflection was a pretty good indicator that I probably should stay in high school. My plan was to move to Yosemite and spend the days climbing the massive granite cliffs. At six feet four inches and 220 pounds, I didn't really have a rock climber's build. I wondered what made me think there was a rock climber in me. When you're at high school, you don't give much thought to what you can't do. For most people, that gets learned later, and for still fewer, it gets unlearned for the rest of life. At the beginning of my junior year, I decided it was time for me to leave high school and make the move to Yosemite. I had a down vest, two red bandanas, and a pair of rock climbing shoes. $25, oh, $25 and a VW Bug. What else did I need? I'd find work in the valley and spend my off time in the mountains. Out of more than courtesy, I swung round to Randy, Randy's house first thing on a Sunday morning to say goodbye to let him know I was leaving. I knocked on the door and after a long couple of minutes, Randy appeared. He was groggy and bedheaded. I'd obviously woken him. I gave him the rundown on what I was doing and all the while, Randy stood there, patiently in the doorway, trying his best to appear uh, to suppress his puzzled expression. You're leaving soon, he asked when I'd finished. Yeah, right now, actually, I said as I straightened my back and barreled my chest to show I really meant business. Look, Randy, it's time for me to get out of here. I came by just to thank you for hanging out with me and being a good friend. Randy kept his earnest and concerned face, but he didn't say a word. Oh, hey. I inserted, will you, will you tell your girlfriend goodbye for me, you know, when you see her next? Again, no words from Randy. He had this weird faraway look on his face, like he was looking straight through me. He snapped back into the conversation. Hey, Bob, would you just wait here for a second while I check something out? No sweat, Randy. I have nothing to do now, so what, what did I care? Randy disappeared for a few minutes into the house while I stood awkwardly on his porch with my hands in my pockets. When he came back out the door, he had a tattered backpack hanging over his shoulders by one frayed strap and a sleeping bag under his other arm. He was focused and direct. All he said was, Bob, I'm with you. Something in his words rang right through me. He didn't lecture me ab about how I was blowing it and throwing the opportunities away by leaving high school. He didn't tell me I was a fool that my idea would fall off the tracks on the way to the launch pad. He didn't tell me I would surely crater even if I did briefly lift up. He was resolute, unequivocal, and had no agenda. He was with me. Despite the kind gesture, I was pretty, it was pretty odd to think he wanted to come along. Uh, I guess so, I said half-heartedly. You sure? Yeah, Bob, I'm, I'm in. Would you mind if I caught a ride with you? Randy looked and stood with a determined look at me. So let me get this straight. You want to you wanna drive to Yosemite with me right now? Yep, that's right. I can find my way back after you get there and get settled in. I'm not sure why I accepted Randy's generous self-invitation. I guess it's because it caught me totally off guard. No one had ever expressed an, in, an interest in me like that, bef like that before. Sure, I stammered. We both stood awkwardly on the stoop I guess we should both get going. And with that, Randy closed the door to his little house 
and we walked side by side to my VW bug. He plopped into the passenger seat and threw off his stuff on top of mine. We got to Yosemite before nightfall and it occurred to me for the first time I had no place to stay. <laughs> we had a couple of sleeping bags, no tent and very little money. So we snuck in through the back of a platform tent sent up for one of those pay per night campers. We slept towards the back in case anybody turned up we could make our escape. Fortunately no one came and the next morning we woke up to a chilly but glorious morning in Yosemite Valley. To the north of us El Capitan store, uh, soared 3,000 feet straight up like a huge granite soldier. Half Dome dominated the landscape to the east. These were my companions in my cathedral. This was the valley-wide living room of my new home. Now, with, now it was time to get a job and settle in. I rolled over in my sleeping bag thinking about how great it was to have Randy with me. I was a little nervous but also excited about my new found freedom. I was a man now. I felt my chin for a sign of weakness, uh, for a sign of whiskers. Nothing yet but I shaved anyway just in case. Randy and I dusted off the stiffness that comes with the camping and went to the, the Camp Curry Companion Cafeteria. We thought we could get a job there flipping pancakes in the morning, which would leave time for us to climb the rest of the day. I finished my job application in front of the manager, handed it to him, and he gave it straight back, sternly shaking his head. No, he didn't even pretend to be interested, but I was secretly thankful, at least he humoured me enough to let me apply. No matter, undaunted, I went to one of the rock climbing outfitters with a storefront in the valley. I told them, whatever I needed, I was sure that I lacked in, in experience. I could make up by what I lacked in maturity and raw intelligence. That's quite a funny statement, that. They said that they, they didn't have any work for me either and that jobs were tight and almost impossible to get in the valley. I walked out of the store discouraged and looked at Randy, who was leaning against the VW. Rather than feeding my discouragement and saying, I told you so, Randy fed my soul with words of truth and perspective. Bob, you can do this thing if you want. You have the stuff that it takes to pull it off. These guys don't know what they're missing. Let's try a few more places. And then, like he'd said the day before on the porch, Randy reiterated his statement. Either way, Bob, I'm with you. His words gave me tremendous comfort. I applied at nearly every business in the valley and struck out every time. There were simply no jobs available and no hope of one opening up. The evening approached, the sun sank low in the hills. It was one of those sunsets displaying the kinds of vibrant colours that would have made a painter's canvas look overambitious. But I still was heartened. This sunset was real, I was in the cemetery, my friend was with me and I still had a shot of my dream. Randy and I headed back to the campsite and snuck into the same tent we commandeered the night before. I didn't sleep well that night as I sorted through my very small list of options. There was no work, I had no money, I was a high school dropout, Randy snored and I had to go to the bathroom. That about covered the list of problems from smallest to greatest. The next morning came with the Christmas, Christmas only fueled my anxiety. Randy stirred next to me in his sleeping bag, gave a couple of phlegm-filled coughs and said to me in a much too cheery voice, let's go climb some rocks. We headed to the foot of the monolith cliffs and bouldered for a couple of hours, talking trash to each other about who was the better climber. By midday, we headed back to the valley to see if any businesses had miraculously decided to expand their operations overnight. It felt like the shop owners had quietly met somewhere and they had learned that I, am, I was arriving in the valley and were conspiring against me to dash my dreams. The same rocks that I'd come to climb were now beginning to look like barricades. I applied, the remaining, uh, I applied to the remaining small shop fronts I had tried the day before. Do I need to waste my breath to tell you what happened? Randy and I sat on the front bumper of my VW Bug and leaned against its flimsy, lightly rusted hood which buckled under our weight. The sun was going low and in the valley again and the granite cliffs I'd hoped to count as my neighbours were casting long shadows on the ground and each darkening shadow pointed towards the exiting of the valley. I'm nearly finished. I only had a few bucks left after buying gas and Randy offered to spring for dinner. As we walked back to our car after eating, I turned to Randy and said, you know, Randy, 
It's been great you've been coming with me, but it looks like I'm striking out. I think what I'll do is head back and finish up high school. After a short pause, Randy said again what became a comfort to me throughout the trip. Man, whatever you decide, just know either way, I'm with you, Bob. Randy had been with me. I could tell he was with me in spirit and with his presence. He was committed to me and he believed in me. I wasn't a project, I was his friend. I wondered if maybe all Christians operated this way. I didn't think so because most of them I'd met up to that time were kind of wimpy and seemed to have more opinions about who or what we shouldn't do or should do than, than Randy does. And without much discussion, Randy and I exchanged a silent look and a nod, which meant we were done. Without a word spoken, I hopped in and we followed the, the path that the uh, mountains had cast us long shadows the day before. I was going back. We didn't talk much, much as we left Yosemite Valley or much of the way home. A dream of mine had just checked into hospice and Randy was sensitive to no enough to know we needed some margin here. We drove for five or six quiet hours. Every once in a while, Randy would check in me with his confident and upbeat voice. Hey, how you doing, Bob? We pulled down some familiar streets into Randy's driveway. There was another car in the drive next to Randy's that looked like his girlfriend's. She visited often. We walked up to the front door and he opened it. I walked up behind him and walked in uninvited, but somehow I felt welcome. On the floor, I noticed a stack of plates and some wrapping paper and a coffee maker and some glasses. On the couch, there was a microwave half in a box. I didn't understand it at first. Had Randy had a birthday? Was it his girlfriend's? A microwave seemed like a weird way to celebrate someone's arrival into the world. I knew Randy wasn't moving because there wouldn't have been wrapping paper. And then from around the corner, the other half of this couple bounded out and threw her arms around Randy. Welcome home, honey. And then the nickel dropped. I felt both sick and choked up in an instant. I realised these were wedding presents on the floor. Randy and his girlfriend had just, just got married. When I had knocked on Randy's door that Sunday morning, Randy didn't see just a high school kid who had disrupted the beginning of his marriage. He saw a kid that was about to jump the tracks. And instead of spending the early few days of his marriage with his bride, he spent it with me sneaking into the back of a tent. Why? It was because Randy loved me. He saw the need and he did something about it. He didn't just say he was for me, he really was with me. He actually was present with me. And what I learned from Randy changed my, changed my view permanently about what it means to have a friendship with Jesus. I learned that faith isn't about knowing all the right stuff or obeying all the right rules. It's something more. Something more costly because it involves being present and making a sacrifice. Perhaps that's why Jesus is sometimes called Emmanuel, God with us. I think that's what God had in mind, for Jesus to be present, to be with us. It's also what he has in mind when it comes to other people. The world can make you think that love can be picked up at a garage sale or enveloped in a Hallmark card, but the kind of love God created and demonstrated was a costly one because it involves sacrifice and presence. It's a love that operates like a sign language rather than being spoken outright. And what I learned from Randy about the brand of love Jesus offers is it's more about presence than in undertaking a project. It's a brand of love that doesn't just think about good things or agree with them or talk about them. What I learned from Randy reinforced the simple truth that continues to weave itself through the tapestry of every great story. Love does. Love does.